that gave me part of the um, those evaluations. I will go through it in some detail probably next week. I just haven't had a chance to uh, go through everything in detail and summarize it. So I've read through it all, just haven't summarized it in an effective way. But the one, uh, one point I do want to address, obviously, is that of Google Docs, which I've never seen such really, really strong worded language as <laughs> Google Docs. You obviously feel really passionate about it. Some of you like it, some of you don't. Um, so I'll, I'll, I will just accept, it, accept the fact that it doesn't work out well for all of you and make the change that you're welcome to submit as Word documents for PDF. But the key point is when you submit a document for your assignment or your report, it needs to be a single document. You will not accept multiple documents that make up your, your submission. It needs to be a single coherent document that flows. That way the TA will comment on it in the comment field, but uh, we will not be cross-referencing spreadsheets and other files and cover letters. Um, so it literally needs to be in the format that you would submit a report to your manager for that uh, your manager then can read in a linear structure that you have for all of your data. So, so just on that then, if you're pasting spreadsheets into your Google Docs, paste them as images uh, so that it substantiates the answer to your question. Is that, is that clear? Okay, so Word documents that you then share by Google Drive, PDFs that you share by Google Drive, so that you can find the files in Google Drive. It follows the basic so, so those are the only three ways we'll, we'll accept um, electronic submissions. Okay, the class from last time on Tuesday we started to cover the bare module method as a way to estimate the prices of capital items. So today's class and in, in the next two three classes, we're going to look at this method. Uh, we'll also um, spend some time and wrap up the session by looking at estimating manufacturing costs. So these are raw materials and other costs that we have. But over at least the next two three days, we'll be looking at uh, capital items. And because there's no tutorial on Monday, some of this class will actually be used as a tutorial, some of this class time will be used as tutorial style uh, time, where you will work on some problems with your group members, um, you will require some of those electronic documents that I posted to the course website to, uh, to, to work on that, and then we'll um, answer and, and take up the answers together in the form. The reason is because I'm aiming at next week Thursday to wrap up the economic section and then we start the safety section on Friday with Dr. Marlin uh, will be giving the first safety lecture. So we had said that the way that we, uh, the approach we follow for the Bay module method, which is the way um, many people approach cost estimation, not just in the process industries, but if you look at realtors and how they establish the price for a house or people who sell cars secondhand, how they would Absolutely, that sort of thing, or, or not classic, and even class uh, first hand where the company has to come up with some price for it. Um, there's, there's a number of ways we can do it, but the common way is to take a base class at a known period in time for a known set of conditions. So for the most generic material, for ambient temperatures, and for relatively low close to atmospheric or, or actually atmospheric pressure. Then we'll adjust stuff for the fact that the unit we're looking at is not the same capacity as the base unit. We'll inflate for material changes, temperature and pressure changes. And we'll also inflate for the fact that money value has changed during that time. And we'll talk a bit about how we do that in the next class. We, uh, we sort of ended last class at that point. Then we'll estimate our labor for materials and uh, labor, sorry, and materials and installation to help get what we call um, the bare module cost. So this base price will let you get um, FOD and the FOD will let you get the bare module cost. So let's take a look at, um, just to recap that, the FOD is when this heat exchanger or unit is on the freight being shipped to your company. 
the manufacturer will give you a quote saying, this is where you can come pick up this unit, that's their FOB class. This is the quotation the vendor gives you, and it has a dollar for it. Then it's up to you to deliver that unit to your location and install it in what we essentially call a bare module. The bare module is this region of about 3 meters by 3 meters by 3 meters that contains the unit and additional piping, insulation, painting, uh, and all the layers to get that unit to go up. Hey guys, just at the back. So once we've got this unit delivered and created, there's a big, big chunk of money spent on installation, installing the piping and instrumentation. Those are substantial costs. Uh, we'll see today just how much piping makes up out of this, out of this dead model. Uh, installation and uh, sorry, installation and painting. Uh, those are relatively minor costs. And then electrical and utility hookup. And then engineering supervision is about 10% of the incremental price. So. What we wanted was an approach where we could simply say, well, given this quotation we get from the vendor, or an estimate of the, of the actual capital item itself, can we find some factor, which we call the bare module factor, that we simply multiply that price by and get the bare module cost? Rather than trying to add up every single line item here of inspection and unpaid piping and so on, rather than trying to estimate them all individually, can we not just come up with some single factor that we can multiply this FOB value by to get the bare module? But once we get the bare module factor, that's still not quite the total price we're going to end up paying. Uh, we spoke a bit last class that there will be about 5% of that price will be due to contractors fees. There will be a contingency in there uh, that varies between 10 and 15 percent based on the company's uh, choice. And that will get us our total module price. <coughs> and we're still not there. Price. There's still additional price that due to the land and royalties and other factors that come in, uh, but those are so case specific to the to the item that you're estimating the cost for that we won't cover uh, those in the course. And they're fairly straightforward. If you needed to know uh, what these are, you would go speak to people internal into your company. So your finance group would have a good idea of some of those numbers of, of legal fees and land and fees and so on. So we, we don't focus on estimating those. Arguably, even this is too detailed for what we need. Remember, our needs are here is to establish a decision on getting these dollar figures for the capital costs. Then we'll put these into cash flows and do an NPD to decide whether the project's feasible or not. So we're really only using these numbers to estimate feasibility. This is our aim here, not to, uh, not to go to the bank and say, we need a check for this much to cover our expenses to, to get this part up and going. We're only at the stage where we're trying to estimate should we even go ahead with this project or not based on the NPD. So we're, we're, we don't need all the costs to, to a high degree of accuracy. And in fact, there's a very high degree of inaccuracy in this method anyway. And where we ended off last time was to say, well, we're going to go to a database and consult consult the database or correlation and get a base price. We'll inflate that base price for the fact that our unit has a different capacity and that the database that we had was probably established sometime in the 70s. So we need to inflate it up to today's dollars. Um, then we've got installation factors and adjustments for different temperatures and pressures. So by the end of today, you'll see how this entire equation with all of the parameters uh, will have a fairly complex example to go through by the in the past today. Yeah. And then just the, uh, the last recap before we get to the new material is that when we ratio the database design, so that's that the, the, the design we look up looking from the database for a known unit, we get that out from the database for a given size of unit. We're trying to uh, determine the cost of our new design A and we know what, what that unit's capacity needs to be. We emphasize that in the last class that that factor that we choose is relevant for the, for the unit we're trying to size. So the example I gave on the heat exchanger, the dominant effect that, that influences the heat exchange price is the surface area. For pumps, it could be horsepower or the flowing fluid, uh, installation columns, it could be the volume. 
of the, of the column and agitators within the column. And we'll see it in Don Woods' table in the in that PDF that I posted. I'll show you how to determine what that capacity factor um, should be, whether it should be area or volume, or flow rate, and so on. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you some guidance on how to do that. Now, just one other caution here is that if you're looking for a value of n, it's usually 0.6. The 6 tenths rule is a good number to use. And it works well if the thing that you're trying to, to ratio over here is not just a single unit. If you're trying to ratio an entire plant or an entire flow sheet, let's say you knew the cost of your competitor's flow sheet, and you're trying to establish a, company, uh, a, a flow sheet and a plant that is of similar technology but different capacity, the value of n that you could use quite comfortably is 0.6. And that value of 0.6 works well for a global type flow sheet. It does not work well for unit by unit by unit. So uh, an heat exchanger versus a compressor versus a pump, there are different values of n for each one of those units that are more suitable. For a global flow sheet, including reactors, piping, pumps, compressors, utilities, n averages out to 0.6 works extremely well. So the bigger the, the, the uh, scope that you're looking at, the closer that value to will be to 0.6. Tinier in scope, definitely don't use 0.6. In fact, there's some units where n is actually greater than 1, which is counter to what our expectation is. It says for a larger unit, we need even more money. Usually we expect diminishing costs for larger units. But some, some units, n will exceed 1. And other units, they'll be lower than 0.6. The other important point here is that whenever you consult one of these correlations, they almost always reference the range over which they're applicable. So here Dr. Marlin has the, the, the comment that what would happen if you increase the capacity a hundred times or more than that? Well, there's a limit to the extent of that correlation. Uh, a very small heat exchanger compared to a very large heat exchanger. Those correlations that we'll see today, they're bound between which they, they work well. Beyond that, you're probably going to get a very crude estimate of the little breakdown. Uh, it's just not being established what what those bounds are always. Well, uh, sorry, the bounds have been established. It might be that the capacity you're looking for are outside those bounds because you're building a unit that's that's much bigger than anyone else has ever built. So there's little uh, to go on. Okay, and then the final uh, thing we looked at last class was these inflation factors, and, and we, we kind of ended up at this point, and I wanted to take it up from here. How these, how these factors work for inflation. So the general, the general uh, principle is as follows. If you have the cost of, of a unit in historical dollars, so C0 is the cost back in some previous point in time. So I'm going to that O, o you can see for cost old or the original cost if you want the cost in today's dollars, you multiply by the inflation factor now divided by the inflation factor, by the inflation factor that was present at the time that you had that cost for. And that will get you the cost now dollars. So usually this term in brackets is greater than 1. And I say usually, but you see it's not always true. But almost always that the value of the unit has gone up since the historical point of time. Now, these indexes that we use here, are, we're not uh, going to use the consumer price index because as we said last time, the consumer price index is a representation of inflation for regular goods that people buy on a day-to-day -day basis, the grocery store and other places. For the construction industry and for the petrochemical and process industries, we have different indexes available to us. The first one is the Marshall and Swift index. And then you can see in 1970 it was established at 301, and since 2000 it's now at 1089. And I've posted on the website uh, some other uh, numbers for it over here. So if you go, go to the website, I've, I've given these to you all the way up to, to 2011. So you'll see here that it generally goes up, though you'll find sometimes actually the index goes down. At 
So, so some, from time to time, this index will trend down again for just for a, for a year or two, and then it will go back. <coughs> but the overall trend of, on a long-term basis is that any ratio that you take from the previous year <coughs> old yeah. to year now, that this ratio will almost always be exceeding one. So the Marshall and Swift index is a good overall index. Um, let me just quickly describe it to you. It uh, consists of 47 industries. So cement, rubber, glass, uh, petrochemical. Um, petrochemical makes up 48% of the weight in that index. Uh, rubber it makes up 8%. Chemical, sorry, chemicals make up 48%. Petrochemicals make up 22%. So there's a, a strong domination there from chem, uh, chemicals and petrochemicals in that index. And it, it, it's a global index that uh, is comprising machinery, equipment, installation, and how those, those ratios have changed from year to year. So the, the index, you can go to the, to the journal publication uh, that, that publishes Marshall Swift, and you can, they will give a breakdown of how the index is calculated. So back in, whenever the index was established, they will they'll give a value. So not Marshall and Swift, but for example, this index in 1967, it was just arbitrarily benchmarked at 100. Marshall and Swift will also have its artificial benchmark probably somewhere in the 60s based on those trends. So somewhere in the 60s when this index was established, they said we're fixing at 100 <coughs> for a given weight of industries, rubber, chemical, petrochemical, glass, and others. They establish a, a benchmark, and then they keep that benchmark going from year to year to year, and ratioing the index up. The ENR, the engineering news record, this index is primarily for labor. So it's the cost of skilled labor and unskilled labor uh, to, to install equipment. That's pretty much all it is. It's a construction index. So if you had just the labor and materials components of, of your cost that you were wanting to implement, that would be a better index to use. If you were, if you were looking at the capital items, including labor, the Marshall and Swift index would be. The Nelson Farrow index, that is particular to the petroleum industry. So if you're working on a flow sheet in the petroleum industry, rather use that index than, than the other three. Uh, and then the final one is the chemical engineering plant cost index. This is the default index we should be using. If, if, the, if you're ever under any doubt, um, rather use the ChemEng index. The Marshall and Swift index would be your next pair. So ChemEng and then Marshall and Swift. Uh, so let's just talk about the ChemEng index a bit. 61% um, of that index is made up out of the material, the piping, fabrication, instrumentation, pumps, electrical, structural. So that 61% of the index is made up from those components. 22% of the index is installation and labor. 7% is due to buildings and materials. And then the final 10% is, is the um, engineering and supervision. So just to give you an idea of, of the relative breakdown, uh, that implies then that in the chemical industry we tend to see that ratio as well. Any of your final project's cost, 61% of, of the total cost in, in a project probably has gone towards the actual equipment. Then 22% of that cost has gone to just installing it, 7% due to buildings and ancillary things <coughs> around it, and then 10% of the total capital cost has just gone to supervision. This is people like you who end up working in companies that you're managing the contractors coming to your site. So that's, that's, that's the cost of you to the company. It's going to be about 10% of the capital price. Um, so there tends to be people like us that, that engineer and supervise the product, um, and supervise the installation. So that's how that energy index is made, made up. The sources for them are those, those publications. So both the Marshall and Swift and the Chemical Engineering Index who would consult the Chemical Engineering Journal. Uh, they publish those indexes monthly. So someone in, in those publications decides every month to poll a variety of companies and they establish that index every month that gets revised and then uh, once a year they fix, fix it to the average price in the world. The Nelson Ferry Index being a petroleum index uh, appropriately fit in the oil and gas journal, which most 
having every controller in front of me has subscriptions to that, and then the engineering user record uh, index appears in the journal, but with the same name. Okay, so there's just a bit of the, uh, the trends over time, if you're, if you're interested. Uh, <coughs> And now we get to this example that I, I hope you had a chance to print out those slides I put on the website just because the ones here in your notes are pretty poorly printed um, and small. So we're going to need this table to understand this uh, question in today's class. Uh, so what... So if you have this table in front of you, let's take a look at it and uh, we'll discuss how to read it. that matches the unit for size. So in this example, we're, we're looking at a shell and tube heat exchanger. So if I need to determine the cost of a shell and tube heat exchanger, I will go look up in Don Woods' book, in the table of contents, heat exchanger utilities are in chapter five, and I would then go to chapter five, and you can see this page, the screenshot comes from page five dash five. So in the index for Don Woods' book, if you look up heat exchanges, it tells you it's in chapter five, and then scroll through chapter five, there's about eight or nine pages, and then what guides you are the pictures. So the various configurations of the shell and tube heat exchanges and other types of heat exchanges. And then we read the table, the first column says shell and tube heat exchanger with floating head operating at 1,140 kPa. CS, carbon steel in carbon steel shell. Fetch delivered cost. So we're going to put what's given us in this row over here are the factors related to the delivered cost. In other words, this FOV cost uh, delivered to our site. Standard 4.85 meter length tubes with either 15, uh, either, I can't even read this out. Uh, 25 or 1.9 centimeter outer diameter to choose on a square or a triangular pitch. So very, very specific base configuration for the heat exchanger. I'll talk about size in a minute. If it's one, you can just ignore it. Here it's telling us the way to size this unit for capacity is based on its heat transfer area. So this is how you know where, what to use as your capacity ratio. We're going to use surface area. In other columns over here, this is the after cooler for a compressor. It says to use meters cubed per second. That would be the, the factor that you use when you ratio your capacity. But for heat exchanges, we're basing our ratio on area. And here the base area is for for 10 squared, so 100 meters squared unit. And the base cost is 10 to the 3 in this column, 8, so $8,000. So for this base heat exchanger, our FOB is $8,000. If we're designing it for a certain capacity, 
we put our, our capacity on that numerator. So whatever our area is for our heat exchanger that we're, we're looking to design. Uh, let's say our area is, in the example that we'll see next, is 70 meters squared. For just as an example. We ratio it relative to this base case. This is 100 meters squared. So here in the numerator, you would put whatever capacity you're using. I'm just putting 70 because this is the example I'm, I'm working with here. And the very next thing we must check is to ensure that the range of this correlation is valid for us. So here's the range over which this correlation is valid. This range, please note, is referring to this ratio in the brackets. It's not referring to the range of the areas. So this ratio is, uh, this range here is not saying this, uh, this table is valid for 0 0.02 meters squared to 20 meters squared. This is the range for the ratio. So here my ratio is 0.7. It's within the range of 0.02 to 20. So I'm, I'm good to go for the rest of the rest of this table. And then the key Next one is telling me which exponent to use. In that ratio is n is 0.71. So heat exchangers, the 6 tenths rule would be, would be uh, no good. Heat exchangers are ratioed by a better value of 0.71. It would be a more accurate. The next column here is telling me my error that I should expect with this, 40%. So plus or minus 40% error at the end. So when I re report my bare module cost, I will subtract 40% and add 40% to get an estimate of the, of the range of the price for this heat exchanger. 2.3 is in the column called L plus M, labor and materials. This is the labor and materials that it would take to install this heat exchanger. So I will call that factor um, F subscript LM. It's a value of 2.3. If I wanted to just estimate the cost of labor and materials for the heat exchanger, I could take that 2.3 and multiply it by this term raised to the power n times 8,000, and that would give me a labor and materials cost. Okay. We're not we're, we're we're not using that. We're interested in the column just two over from that the BM column that says use a factor of 3.14. And that then will give me an estimate of the fair module cost at which date and time. It's 70s. In fact, if you look a little bit closer here, the so bare module cost, uh, their top corner is MS equals 300. Marshall and Swift index was 300 at the point in time when this uh, table was established, which actually is not the mid 70s, it actually corresponds exactly to 1970. Uh, so I, I, I'm not exactly sure how Don would set up this table, but I see this MS equals 300 there, and I pr presume it's. it's it's either 1970 or just after that that this, these correlations were established. Either way, you wouldn't be bad by overestimating your inflation. So rather than use a value in, for the index from 1975, rather than go use something from 1970, rather overestimate your cost slightly. So I would tend to use an NS index value of, of about 300 for this table. So this is bare module cost, and to emphasize that it's historical, in 1970. So we're going to calculate that out for this heat exchanger. It would be 0.7 raised to the power of 0.71 times $8,000 multiplied by, so I've shown this here for you so you can see that. So we're, we're sizing a heat exchanger that's smaller than, uh, than this uh, 100 meter squared heat exchanger. So that cost just for size would be 6,200 would be this, the dollars we pay, multiplied by 3.14. This is to get the cost of that heat exchanger installed and painted with the foundations, piping, everything else that goes into that bare module. So 
So it comes up to 9,500. Uh, 9, okay. In 1970. <coughs> then if we want to get that to 2,000, I'm just going to use the year 2000 now. We can take this up and multiply by the, the index for 2000 divided by the index for 1970. So in the denominator there, and then the index for 2000 was uh, Marshall and Swift in 2000 was 1089. So this gets me a price of 2000 of 70,785. Plus or minus 40%. So you would then report that as uh, being something between 2,700. For a, a carbon steel heat exchanger of that base, uh, that base configuration, but for a different capacity, slightly smaller capacity, then two thousand dollars would be between anywhere between forty-two, forty-three thousand, and ninety-nine thousand. Very broad range there. That area is due to two things. It's due to the fact that suppliers, um, one supplier has different prices than another supplier. Uh, so these, are, these are from a variety of North American suppliers. And then the other variability that it comes due to the fact that uh, some suppliers will have preferential contracts with certain of their customers. So uh, the same supplier will give two different prices to two different customers, depending on their relationship. So there's variability within suppliers and there's variability between suppliers that plays into creating a very large number of customers. So uh, just a quick recap then of the approach you should follow. So this isn't in the notes and we're going to take this down because it can get, um, we're going to see now in the next step that we're going to take this complexity up a little bit. But the general procedure is as follows. Uh, step one is find correlation. Look for the appropriate chapter, and the little pictures that Don Woods have are, are helpful just to guide you to make sure that your vessel is the appropriate orientation, vertically or horizontally, or the type of configuration that you have in mind. Uh, step two, check that the name matches. To find the appropriate code in that table. Name matches, and then just check. Um, correlation range. So, the, using these tables clearly requires that you have the capacity of your unit in mind. You've already uh, established your flow sheet and, and sized your pumps, you've sized your compressors, you've sized your installation columns and so forth. Check that uh, the capacity factor and calculate the ratio between the base uh, capacity and your desired capacity and make sure that that correlation range, so check, check correlation range. Then you uh, read the base class. Capacity. 
using that exponent n. What you do next then is we will see this in the next example. You will adjust we'll adjust for, for um, or we'll call these directions for materials. Pressure and maybe temperature. We'll have to make some adjustments for that. So this is the complexity we're going to look at next, is how to make the adjustments when what we're desired, what we're trying to cost doesn't match the base case in, in that table. Then you'll um, become the final model of cost. The next step then is to inflate to today's dollars. And the final step is to report the total with error. So there is a systematic procedure to, to doing this, and so it's no surprise then that uh, some companies have set up automated spreadsheets and software to do this, where you would key in your unit, the capacity that you have, the temperature and pressure and material differences that you were looking for, and then the computer or the spreadsheet goes ahead and calculates these costs for you. And uh, even um, some of the flow sheeting software that you use, like Aspen, um, has a, has a plug-in module to do this for you. In this course, we will be doing this by hand and using the tables. There's just one other point to mention here is that your choice to bring up the cost to today's dollars, you can either postpone that to the very end or you can do that near the beginning. So either way would work because it's a small cognitive factor that will carry through. Um, some people choose to, to get the base cost and then immediately escalate that to today's dollars and then complete the rest of these calculations in today's dollars. Other people would prefer to work at the base case 1970 during these adjustments and then just inflate the total up. Um, either, either of those approaches would work. You should get the same percent answer. So let's take a look at a, at a slightly more complicated example. We're going to look at a shell and tube heat exchanger. That's what it would look like on the material. Um, here's one from the Vartec plant out in Stone Creek. And what we're going to, uh, we've, we've looked at this base case already. This is the exercise I had on the board where uh, we were looking at one, one atmospheric pressure and 70 meters squared. So we've already costed that and we've already calculated um, that final $70,000. So we don't need to go through this slide. Now let's take a look at, at, a, different, at a different issue. Um, what if we want to calculate the, the cost for a heat exchanger that does not match those base cases? So, for example, let's look at a, at a heat exchanger that's now operating at 3 MPa rather than the, the 1 atmosphere of pressure that the base heat exchanger is for. Uh, we would like to use stainless steel rather than carbon steel for the shell and, uh, and the tubes. And we would like uh, to use non-standard tube -like. So we've got these additional changes that we, we want to make. Here's the question then that we're asking. If we look at this um, bare module concept, considering that the bare module costs are made up of these components, which of those bare module, uh, if any of those parameters, would, have, would be changed by our choice to go to different materials of construction and operate at different pressure? So we're looking at changing our, our operating condition of pressure, and we're looking at changing our material. Can we still go use this bare module cost factor that we had over here? We had this value of 3.14 and, and, and estimated cost. Um, which of those factors in, inside the bare module would, would actually be affected by this choice of new materials? 
talk with the, for, for a minute or two with the person next to you and see if any of those um, would be affected by the choice. <laughs> carbon steel. We're going to have to change our piping inside the band module to match that as well to prevent corrosion issues. Um, inspection, I would say, possibly would be affected, but I, I, would, I would pretty much say no and capture that in the 40% error that we have in this ratio anyway. Um, better instrumentation also, I would say, to a very, very minor extent, may, will, would be inflated for sure, but again, I would, it would be, get captured in that 40%. The incremental amount of that um, instrumentation and the incremental amount of that inspection would be relatively small for a change from carbon steel to stainless steel. So here, um, then the key issue is that if we look at our bare module factor, it's not going to be appropriate just to take out our, our existing numbers and multiply them by the bare module factor. We're going to have to make some more messy adjustment for it, which is what this slide tries to convey in a process control type terminology with, with loops and, and lines which I don't want to go through. You can certainly interpret it this way if you want, um, but I would like to take a look at it in this tabular form, and then we can come back and try to make sense of it as I So what I'm going to, to do then for this discussion is to do it uh, through an example for a few minutes that we have, and just take a look at, at the two issues here. One is to say well, we're operating at, let's, let's take a pressure of 5.6 MPa. Uh, that's going to be the amount of pressure. And we're going to look at stainless steel for the shell and tubes. Some of the things we need to then go modify from our table. So we can actually just let me make a note of that here. and we're going to use 316 and steel for our material construction. If we go look back at this uh, table from John Wood's book, we see some of the modifications that are available to us. If we're going to modify our pressure, there's a number of pressures that are listed here in MPA. We're going to say, uh, well, the examples can even be chosen the pressure that is that's listed in that table. So 5.6 MPa, it says to use a modification factor of 1.52. So let's just put the F subscript M, uh, sorry, M subscript P, for making a factor to account for pressure differences is 1.52. If the pressure was uh, somewhere in between these numbers, you would just determine it. So first, um, for, for a pressure of 10, we would be somewhere between 7 and 22 over here. We would then interpolate between the 1.55 and the 2.55 to find the appropriate multiplicative factor to inflate our prices by. So here in this case, our prices are going to be inflated by 50% to account for the higher pressure that we would use. 
Um, our tubes inside the carbon steel shell, uh, if we were going to use aluminum tubes, carbon tubes, glass, etc., there's more things and factors over here. So some of the most expensive are titanium, inconel, and asteroid would multiply the cost by nine or eight, as much as 8.5. If we're modifying our tubes and our shell to be made out of stainless steel 316, this is the one that we're focusing on. It says use a multiplicative factor of three so if something is then it's the value of three. Just a, a comment then on some of the other factors because we won't have the time to, to cover the rest of this example in the class, so I'll, I'll pick this up next time, but I'm going to just use the factors and then start off the next class with them. Um, some of the other modifications you could make though is if you were using U-shaped tubes or if there was a kettle reboiler, um, or if you just wanted an estimate of the tubes only. And if you have an existing shell and you're just replacing the tubes in that shell, um, the multiple factor would be 0.3. Um, or an expansion joint on the fixed tube space, the additional factor on the MT5. Then these remaining numbers here in the table are references in London to go and look for where that information came from. So what I'll do is I'd like you to try the following. Just bear in mind the way that these multiplicative factors work are literally you take your base cost, multiply the capacity, and then you go and multiply that by the the pressure factor and the materials factor. So calculate a rough estimate of what this uh, shell tube exchange would be for next class. Uh, and then we'll, I'll take it up tomorrow and show you.